Patch Patch. Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shoni Wan, and with me as always, it's John via the Skype. John, what's going on? Are you ready for what we're going to talk about today? I've been waiting this my whole life. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about this. You know, we, we, we've been talking about doing this, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of people out there who have their strengths and weaknesses with this story. And, um, you know, I think my strengths, my three strengths, are talking about uh, John, RL- <laughs> okay, yes. RLJ, right. and third, certainly not least, my hatred for Catelyn Tully. Well, I mean, there are other characters that you hate. Right off the bat, Robert Baratheon, Sansa. Right. I know that you've been souring on Bran over the last few years. Rob Stark is another guy that I know that you used to like a lot, right. but you soured on him over the last couple of years. Right. The common denominator here is they're all Tully's. They all look the Tully side. Rob, Sansa, Bran, they have the Tully look. And seemingly the Tully mindset. Exactly. <laughs> always messing up. That's, that's their new motto. You know, that hook, line, and sinker, and always messing up. They're always doing something that just messes everything else up. But it's not like they're deciding that they want to do the worst possible thing. They just end up doing the worst possible thing. Where, like, Eddard always seemed to have a lease. I can't even say Eddard had, like, foresight. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even say that, unfortunately. <laughs> but you always saw with Eddard, at least there was, like, thought behind it. You know what's interesting is, is how are these guys, like, the main characters? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, the Tullys just seem to have, like, no thought of consequences at all on any action that they do. For every action they do, they have like they 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 base it as if there won't be a reaction. Okay, right. Whereas Ned, at least he's making bad decisions, but he's making them because he's an honorable guy. Right. This is his chorus. This is this is what he's gonna do. This is this is the game I play. I know there's problems with it, but I have to do it. And his mistake is while he does look at the consequences that may come about or the repercussions of the decisions that he makes. Ned's failure is that he doesn't expect the worst out of people. Like, he's too trusting in other characters' honor. And that's his downfall. That's what leads to his bad decisions. Him giving the benefit of the doubt to people like Cersei, like Littlefinger, like Renly Baratheon. Whereas Catelyn doesn't seem to give anybody the benefit of the doubt. While maybe there is some thought into her decisions, and I wouldn't say that she's making bad decisions for the sake of ruining her house, but she definitely doesn't seem to learn from her decisions. And it doesn't seem like there's any worse decision that she could have made in any of the bad decisions that she's made. Are there worse things that she could have done in this story? I mean, I guess she could. Um, There are definitely things she could have done. I'm sure Ned kind of had his hand Forced on because he knew he couldn't keep John and Winterfell with him in the, in the south. He couldn't take John to King's Landing. Right. So Callan wouldn't want him there. Wow, could you imagine Ed Callan trying to have order someone to kill John? Wait, what? I think I, I thought about that if he stood in Winterfell. Would she order someone to kill him? Do you think she would have done that? Yes. Really? Do you think she would have done that with Ned alive, or you think that's something she might have... Obviously goes up after Ned's killed, but she would. She's really a hateful person. Should we just go back to the, that... that uh, The exchange between yeah. her and, and John right. at Bran's bed. It's a, right, it's a lot worse in the books. It's a lot worse in the books. The show kind of like mellowed it out a little bit. Uh, they, they totally mellow it out, because they know that Catelyn is... Especially for season one, Catelyn's one of their main characters that the, the audience right. is going to get behind. I mean, there's, there's been a few cases of that in the TV show where they mellow out what a certain protagonist has done or, or a certain character that the audience is going to like. They mellow out what they've done to make them seem right. 
more like a good guy instead of a character that has some shades of gray. Perfect example is actually in season three when... Um, oh, is this a Catelyn scene? Are you uh, talking about when she was... No, talking? no, 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 it's uh, about Jamie action. They said, you know, when Roose Bolton kills Rob Stark... Oh, right, right, in right. In the books, he says, Jamie Lash sends his regards yes. to show they change it to, to generalize it to the last or send their regards. Yes. Because you don't want to pinpoint it too much on Jamie because there's Jamie's arc is going to change. Well, Jamie was at the beginning of his, his face turn, so to speak. And if you have Jamie Lannister sends his regards before you stab the guy that most of the audience thought was going to win the day, that kind of ruins the Jamie face turn. Right. Another example I was thinking of, besides the scene with John and Catelyn over Brandon's bed, it was a scene just written for TV between Catelyn and Talissa, Rob Stark. Oh, yeah, I couldn't stand that. TV show I, the, the, There's one. I mean, I kind of like that scene in a way, but I just, I don't get, like, why do they have to say that John's got brown eyes? I mean, why can't they just, you know, yeah, I, I looked at his beady brown eyes. He doesn't have brown eyes. It, it, that, that, that always bothered me. Like, why can't they just say he has, that he has gray eyes? It's not like you look at Kit Harrington and say, oh, no, no, the show's lying, they're brown. Yeah, those you eyes can hardly even tell. No. You can hardly even tell. But what about the scene itself, her saying those things about John, almost like she regretted the way that she treated John? Right. Then <laughs> she's regretting it, then all of a sudden she realizes, but I couldn't keep my promise. Right. John, who would you say are your, we'll put Catelyn at number one with a bullet, but your least five favorite characters in A Song of Ice and Fire? Kylan Tully's number one. No doubt. Santa Tully is number two. Well, actually, you know what? Number three is Santa Tully. I'll, you know, I'll put number two. I'll put Ramsey Snow. Really? Hate Ramsey Snow. I think number four, it's where, that's where it gets tough now because like, now you can kind of like, you can fling so many different people in there. You know what I'm saying? You can just. <laughs> it's also a lot of names just, at the wall. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Robert Baratheon's definitely like in the top five. Definitely. And uh, um, the other one would have to, ah, uh, jeez, man. Peter Baelish. Okay, interesting. Interesting. So Brandon and Rob have not reached that level for you? No, but I don't think Brandon would be in the top 10. Rob's top 10 now. Wow. Well, Brandon still has the opportunity to. Yeah, oh, yeah. Man. <laughs> I was just thinking about this before. I saw, uh, I, didn't, I didn't click on the uh, video since we were about to set up, but YouTuber uh, Gray Area had a video out today, and it was, uh, are uh, Daenerys and Bran enemies. And I'm just going back to the whole, well, uh, you know, just thinking about that, you know, if that, if that is true, then John again fits in the middle. He's the middle, he's the middle point. Yes. And that's something that I've been saying, like, you know, he's the song, he's the balance of ice and fire. So then it got me thinking about Bran again. And I'm just thinking that that third huge twist, I just feel it has something to do with Bran. All right, so to reiterate, these three twists that George Martin told Benioff and Weiss about, right? One was this, the burning of Shireen, status burning of Shireen. Right. The second and was Hodor. The hold the door. So you're thinking the third one has to do with Bran. The Brand. third I know, twist I know has to do with Bran. It, it, it just has to at this point. There's got to be something that he does. There's going to be something that he does that we're all going to be like, oh, no, you asshole, kill him. I mean, he hasn't really he hasn't really done anything to that level yet. I don't he's, think. But he's done a lot of things wrong, though. He's done a lot of things he shouldn't be doing in books and in show. He is still a kid and he's learning, but he does have to have that big time mistake. There's something I'm telling you. There's got to be. There's something. Oh, it just has to be. It has to be. So it has to be something to do with the Knights King or the right. others in general, right? Mm -hmm. And costing Westeros or House Stark heavily. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. It has something to do with Bran. Because any uh, any other twist, I think, at this point, I, I think is something that's just not going to be shocking. Because I think, we, you know, anyway, oh, I, I can see that. I can see that. Like, Bran, although it, I just feel like people are taking his, his character. I think mainstream show runners who really aren't too in deep things just take him for granted in a way. Oh, he's, oh, he sees all this information. He does, you know, oh, okay, blah, 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 blah. Oh, it's the, it's I, the I, don't, I don't think they're really grasping that he could really... He's set up to do damage. They're just like, oh, it's the magic cripple kid. Yeah, it's the meme guy. But I mean, if you if you think about, especially for a character that's been around since the beginning and is still around in the Song of Ice and Fire, if you look at John, if you look at Sansa, if you look at Arya, 
And just taking their arcs in Game of Thrones, you can kind of relate it to Song of Ice and Fire, where we're at, but we're not quite at the last act of A Song of Ice and Fire. But those are three major characters around since the beginning. Cersei, Jaime, all of them. And they've all gone through an arc where their perspective on things has changed. But they've also, I would wager, and I can think of a few examples off the top of my head, but I would wager that all of those characters have had a moment where they thought they were making a smart decision based on things that they've learned during their character arc. And they make that decision and find out that it's the wrong thing. So case in point with Jon Snow, when he's murdered by the Night's Watch, he didn't see it coming. It was a mistake that he made. He thought he had, you know, spending all that time with the Wilding, spending the time as personal squire for G.R. Mormont, he thought he knew what he was doing because of his character's arc. And maybe he did, maybe he was doing the right thing, but he he made a mistake, he made a tactical error in trusting the upper echelon of Night's Watch leadership with the direction he was going in with the Night's Watch. With Sansa, I would say from Game of Thrones, with her agreeing to marry Ramsay Bolton, Ramsay Snow, thinking that that was something she can handle based on her already being married to Joffrey or uh, engaged to Joffrey, and it wasn't something she could handle. With Arya, her going over to Braavos and thinking she wanted to be a faceless man and then finding out that she didn't want to be no one, she wanted to be Arya Stark. You know, she made a decision based on her experiences, thinking it was the right decision, ends up not being the right decision for her. With Bran, I mean, I guess you could argue that his fuck-ups in the cave of the children and the three-eyed raven, you know, maybe that was his mess up, but it doesn't seem like that. I mean, it did cost Hodor his life and it cost him Summer, but I don't think that that was quite it. I I don't think that that, you know what I mean? I don't think that's the ultimate lesson, so to speak, that he needed to learn. I go back to what Blood Raven, the show Blood Raven, whatever you want to call him, said, stay too long. What was the phrase? He said, stay too long. You'll be trapped or something to that effect, right? Right. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to do something where he's going to stay too long. Inside the body. Of the Inside the body, game. right. And he's going to be trapped. Hmm. That's going to be the fatal mistake. Bring it back to Catelyn Tully. Is there any sort of arc for this character? In your opinion? Does she seem to learn anything or grow in any way? I'm, you know, I'm trying to think about that in all seriousness. I'm trying to... Yeah, I don't think she does, dude. Because like, it just like she just dies in such... I mean, listen, in the book, she still has some of her arc going on with uh, the Lady Stoneheart, and I have no confidence that she's going to do anything right with that either. I think she's going to screw up that, too. I think think that's her arc. I think her arc is to be, is a kind of a chess-moving piece that is looked upon as... Like One Direction? what What the reader would think as a... A protagonist, but really, what she does, she causes. What's that like? That term of that, you know, the chaos, like um, the, uh, the 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 the. Uh, I'm trying to think of the word, the, the the term, the cause and effect. Okay, of what she does just affects how stark, like the repercussions. And such, and, right, she causes so much things, and it just has all these other effects on things that she's not even around, but she just affects everything. It seems she affects them unknowingly, because I don't think that she makes these decisions, though they are bad decisions, regardless of what the repercussions are for outside of the tiny bubble she's in. Most of these decisions are bad for the tiny bubble she is in, meaning her and Rob and whatever leadership Rob is surrounded with, be it Game of Thrones, be it A Song of Ice and Fire, the decisions that she makes when she's with them tend to be bad for them, but they're also bad for the realm or for right. the north or the riverlands. You know, for Eddard, that starts mm-hmm. the whole entire, you really, yeah. the start of the whole entire war is really because of freaking Catelyn believing in Littlefinger and her, her own little uh, meddlings. And you know what I think is, I, I think what's most interesting, what I'm finding most interesting, and I think that as we go through Catelyn Stark, we'll, we'll see this, is that Catelyn Stark and Cersei Lannister, I don't think that they're very different at all. And I, I I would wager, by the time we're done talking about Catelyn Tully, I have more respect for Cersei Lannister, because she's at least honest about what she's doing, whereas Catelyn's doing basically, well, not basically, arguably, the same things that Cersei's doing, but Catelyn's lying to herself or lying to her loved ones, saying that it's for her family or for, wait, wait, for the good. Saying that, that she's lying, she's not even really... Like, Cersei understands all her actions. She knows what she, you know, she knows if I kill House Tyrell, I, you know, that's going to have ramifications, and she doesn't care. 
She'll right. deal with those ramifications. Catelyn, on the other hand, doesn't realize the ramifications that she pulls. So, of which two do you respect more? Do you respect more the person who, who, who can see what the ramifications are, but still feels it's the right decision for herself and her closest family, loved ones, and makes that decision? Or the fucking woman who, like, just blindly makes decisions thinking they're good decisions, not thinking about the repercussions? And then bad repercussions happens, and then she doesn't learn, and she still makes these decisions. And there's more bad repercussions. Like, which, which character can you respect more? And I, I think it's Cersei Lannister. Not that I agree with any Cersei Lannister's decisions, but you can argue that the decisions Cersei makes, the decisions that Catelyn makes, a lot of them are maybe, maybe they're equal in the damage that they cause. But of the two, at least, Cersei is using her fucking brain, whereas Catelyn doesn't seem like she's using her brain, at least not her entire brain, just like a little, a little portion of it. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that I think we will find is that the differences between Catelyn Tully Stark and Lady Stoneheart I don't think that they're that much different either. I think that they're both one track mind. Right. And one is consumed with, honestly, I I get the feeling that Catelyn Tully Stark is almost consumed with power or power hungry or being in charge. And Lady Stoneheart is consumed with vengeance against those that stopped her from getting that power. And we'll get into the Red Wedding later on. But I think another question that we will address is, I think we've addressed it before too, but yeah, the Red Wedding's a horrible thing and, and House Frey is the worst, but can you really blame them for the Red Wedding? I mean, you do. You, you have to blame them. It, w- it was them and Roose Bolton with Tywin Lannister's blessing, but can you really blame them? The Red Wedding was kind of set up for them uh, with the with the, with the T-Bowl shot between those two Tullys. <laughs> yeah, bro. It was an underhanded toss right over the plate. You know, what do you expect them to do? It was a week 17 Packers versus Giants, <laughs> right. and uh, right. Strahan needed that last sack. He couldn't get it, so Farm goes down intentionally, so Strahan gets the sack. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. So getting, getting to Catelyn Tully, I, I do want to try to give her the benefit of the doubt, but I am of the foregone conclusion that I'm... Well, there will be no benefit for me, so let's just... Fair enough. I think I'm at the conclusion that when we're done talking about her, I will feel equally as ill about her, or I will be of a mind that I dislike her more than I do today. I'm going to try to make you dislike her more. That's, that's my goal. <laughs> <laughs> and just real quick, and I mean, we, we, we've brushed on this before about the character of Catelyn Tully and how, for me, and I think you'll agree, she reminds me so much almost right. like yes. of uh, President Rosalind. And, Laura uh, Rosalind. Yeah. Laura Rosalind. And, um, mm-hmm. Ballastar Galactica. Interchangeable, almost. I mean, very interchangeable. It's especially people who have watched Ballastar Galactica. You watch that first season, in particular that first season, yeah. and, in, and in, that one, in the pilot episode where, you know, they're getting chased by Cylon. Not with her stupid hair. And hand. Her, her whole... Oh, yeah, that thing was, like, all ridiculous. Jesus. <laughs> but, you know, these two Cylons with, like, nuclear warheads aiming at them. And Lee's like, listen, we gotta get out of here. We, we we have to get out. Of here. And she's like, no, we're not gonna. No, we're 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 gonna continue. Like, but what? <laughs> that is a Catelyn Tully move. I mean, I mean just you know, the straight, narrow minded, don't look at the ramifications of not going to hyperspace at that time. Right, and every- that's Catelyn Tully. I'm right, no matter what. I'm right. Right. So eerily similar. It's just really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a really good comparison. Catelyn Tully and Laura Roslin. Who do you dislike more? Just a quick side. Callan Tully. Okay. Callan Tully. Far and away. Because you know, you, you know what? I'm going to tell you right now. I'll tell you why. Because at least Laura Roslin has a couple moments, in particular the moment when... <laughs> she dies. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. When, when, when Gaeta and Tom Zarek take oh, yeah. over yeah, okay. Galactica. That was her hero moment. And they're, and they're lying... And there, you know, he's that Zarek's lying that, you know, Commander Admiral Adama at that time was, was killed. And Saltai. And then all of a sudden and she turns in. He said Saltai was dead also, right? Probably Saltai also. Yeah. And she's like, no, not now. Not, not ever. ever. I am coming for all of you. Yeah. At least she has that moment, you yeah. know, like where, you know, she has at least one moment there where you're just like, yes. Yeah. Catelyn has no moments like that. None. The closest she got, the closest, I will say this, let me, let's be honest, the closest she got was right after Eddard died in the show, and then, you know, Rob's out there hitting his sword against the tree, and she's like, you know, your, your sisters, we have to get them, and then we'll kill them all. Right. That's as close 
as she got. I don't recall that happening in the book, though. No, I, th- I think that was a uh, yeah, that was a made for a made for TV. That was a Benioff and Weiss original to try and <laughs> make Catelyn a a more identifiable character. Right, right. I think I maybe mean, we'll get into that later on. I think that they, they tried to make you know we, we mentioned before the whole John with the John scene mm-hmm. that they tried to make her maybe even a little more of a protagonist. You know, a little more of. A, a potential hero, which I understand, and, and I'm I'm okay with. But at the same time, I think it would be more interesting if they stuck to George Martin's guns with the character. I, I don't know about you, I, I can't think of anybody in the fandom that holds a banner for Catelyn Tully saying that she's their favorite character or that she's. I got. I don't think. I don't think I've seen anyone. I mean, I've seen people say, you know, put yourselves in her position. I I I respect her. But I've never seen someone say, she's my favorite character. Top five characters. Oh, Catelyn I, Tully. Yeah. <laughs> Sansa. I want to meet. Well, Sansa I want to meet that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mean like something you can say, like, you know, she's all, she's been through so much, blah, 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 while she put it on herself, or whatever. But Callan, I have never met one person, never seen one person say, she's my favorite character. She's and, so and awesome. So I, I want to meet that person. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Callan Stark was so <laughs> awesome. She's so badass the way she just makes decisions. She doesn't even care. She doesn't care what happens. She just makes decisions. <laughs> it's like, whatever. Shit happens. Yeah. Catelyn Tully. Okay, well, I wanted to start. And I, I wanted to do this because I wanted to set a stage for what Catelyn Tully's life was like as a child, hoping that that would give us a better understanding of the decisions that she makes as an adult, as the Lady of Winterfell. And I have to say, I don't think that is going to, but nonetheless, I do find the Riverlands to be a pretty interesting area. It's basically the central region of Westeros. The thing with the Riverlands is because of its location, because of all the rivers, it's made up of plains, forests, rolling hills. The land surrounding the actual rivers is rich and fertile. Being the central region, the Riverlands borders, with the exception of Dorne, it borders on every other kingdom in Westeros. Mm -hmm. The northern border of the Riverlands is right up against the swamplands of the Neck. The Neck is the southern, it counts as part of the north. It's the southernmost part of it. Whereas to the east, the eastern border extends from the Mountains of the Moon, which we know is part of the Vale, down to Crackclaw Point, considered part of the Crownlands. And the southern border of the Riverlands, that also rests on the Crownlands, and it rests against the Reach. And then the western borders meets Iron Man's Bay, which is considered part of the Iron Islands, and it reaches the mountains of the Westerlands. And the Golden Tooth, I recall from reading, but I, I don't think I knew this about the Golden Tooth. It's a really small castle, but it's heavily fortified, and it actually sits on what's called the River Road. Um, and the River Road goes from the Westerlands to the Riverlands. And the Golden Tooth guards the only pass between the mountains of the Westerlands and the Riverlands. And that's really the most direct route between the two. Mm-hmm. And obviously the Riverlands are called the Riverlands because of the number of large rivers that work their way through the area. So obviously you have the Red Fork, which runs from the Western Mountains to River Run, where it merges with the Tumblestone. The Blue Fork flows from, it flows southeast from Seaguard. The Green Fork runs southward from the Neck, and it runs kind of perpendicular to the King's Road. And at Lord Haraway's town, the Red Fork, the Blue Fork, and the Green Fork, that's where they converge together to form the Trident. And the Trident flows from there to the Salt Pans and empties out into the Bay of Crabs. And the three forks of the Trident are the easiest and fastest way to move goods and to move peoples through the region. The main way of transportation through the Riverlands. There's two major crossings over these three rivers. One of them we know is the Seat of House Frey, twins. And then the other is what comes to be known as the Ruby Ford, which is where Robert and Rhaegar had their final battle. There's no major cities in the Riverlands. There are some large towns, Fairmarket, Harrentown, Haraway, Maidenpool, Saltpans. Largest castles in the region are Darry, Raventree Hall, which is home to the Blackwoods, River Run, home to the home to the Tullys, Seaguard, Stonehenge, and the Twins. The biggest castle of all being Harrenhal. This was interesting. I guess it's because of the location, because of the fertile lands. But I thought it would be more populous. But the Riverlands, they're really right in the middle of every region of Westeros. And mm-hmm. the best estimate that I saw, it was on Atlas of Ice and Fire Block, which is a WordPress site, and they estimate the Riverlands to have a population of four million. That population number puts it on par with the north. You got to keep in mind, though, the north, far and away, that's the largest area of Westeros. Mm -hmm. What's the saying? You can fit the entirety of the rest of Westeros in the north. And it also puts it on par with the Vale of Arryn, which I found kind of odd because I didn't think the Vale of Arryn... Right. Wow. I didn't think that would be so... 
Wow, that is strange. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I can think of is like the tribes of wildings in the mountains. I mean, it's got some cities with ports like Goldtown, Runestone, mm -hmm. but it still doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Those are like really ancient houses, first men in the Vale of Aaron. It doesn't seem like it's, it's not easily accessible land, but the only more populated areas in Westeros are the Westerlands and the Reach. And those areas are, I mean, they're wealthy, beautiful areas. So that's understandable. But rivermen or riverlanders are the people that live in the riverlands. And they're a pretty much even mix of warriors, fisherfolk, and loyal common people. The noble houses of the riverlands, also known as the river lords, they are known to be quarrelsome with one another. And an extreme example of this would be the rivalry between houses Bracken and Blackwood. Their rivalry, their aggressive relationship goes all the way back to the Age of Heroes. So the central location of the Riverlands, the lack of natural boundaries amongst the lands claimed by the noble houses of the Riverlands are major reasons why these houses are quarrelsome. It's hard to find a marker where Stonehenge ends and Raventree Hall begins. Going back before there was one king over all of Westeros, it was more likely that these houses are going to war over a mill or over a, a piece of the river. The first men settled the riverlands during the Dawn Age and came into conflict with the children of the forest. The two sides fought for centuries. I don't know, do you get the vibe that like the maesters at the Citadel believe in the children of the forest? I would say no. That's probably something that's harder and harder to believe as time goes on. Right. Or they, or they wouldn't want to believe them. Uh, in them. Yeah. Well, especially because then you get into the Maester Conspiracy where they don't want any sort of magic. Right. And this story goes back to the Dawn Age and they call it the Dawn Age because they believe this to be the beginning of Westeros. And they can't really put a timestamp on how long the Dawn Age is or when the Dawn Age began. But during the Dawn Age, the first men went to war with the children of the forest for centuries. So it's, it's a little bit ridiculous to be able to believe in something like that. But there was a pact signed between them, and it was signed, you know where it was signed, right? At the God's Eye, out of faces. Yeah. It really seems like the first men won this war with this pact, because the children withdrew to the forests, and the first men just openly settled all the lands that had once belonged to the children. And some of the houses, some of the families that ruled the Riverlands during the Age of Heroes are houses Fisher, which I don't think they're around anymore, but Bracken, Blackwood, and House Mud which we learn a little bit about. Actually, we learn a little bit about it uh, from Catelyn Stark, I believe. She tells Rob about King Christopher Mudd and how he died and his whole line died while at war. And the first men ruled the entirety of the Riverlands up until the Andal invasion. And the Andal invaders, they built their own kingdoms. The Riverlands were united for nearly three centuries under the rule of a house Justman. That's J-U-S-T-M-A-N. House Justman expanded the realm of the Riverlands east to Duskendale and Rosby. But the region fell into chaos when House Justman, King Bernar II Justman, and his heirs were all murdered on Pike by Corrid Hoare. Houses Blackwood, Bracken, Vance, Malister, and Charlton fought for rule of the Riverlands for a century, each of them trying to have complete control over the Riverlands. And it was finally House Teague, T E A G U E, that emerged to once again unite the Riverlands. The thing with House Teague, this guy Torrance Teague was an adventurer, not of noble birth, but he was able to get together a group of sellswords, adventurers, they raided the Westerlands and used the gold that they stole from the Westerlands to hire more sellswords from Essos. And after a six-year campaign of war in the Riverlands, Torrance Teague was crowned king of the rivers and the hills so the Riverlands were united under House Teague, but House Teague was not loved by their vassals. So they needed to keep hostages from all the noble houses, and King Humphrey Teague made the decision to repress the worship of the old gods with help from the Faith Militant. And we remember the Faith Militant from, was that season five, I guess? or Well, no, they're in season six too, mostly. Yeah, season five and six. Fucking crazy warriors that follow the faith of the seven. But this decision to repress the worship of the old gods, that led houses Blackwood, Vance, and Tully, 
to rise up in rebellion. And it's kind of interesting that you can take hostages from these noble houses and you can conquer their lands and they're like, all right, fine, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let you rule us. But you take away their religion, you take away what they have faith in, and then they rise up in rebellion. That's it, we're done. Yeah. All right, you can have my daughter. All right, you can have my other daughter. Uh, no way, bro. No way are you taking the old guys. You're not taking this religion. Yeah, you ain't taking the old guys from us. House Teague came close to defeating this rebellion, but a Lord Roderick Blackwood asked for military aid from King Arlen Durandon. And that's D-U-R-R-A-N-D-O-N. And the Durandons were the kings of the Stormlands before the Baratheons. There was a battle called the Battle of the Six Kings in which King Humphrey Teague his brother and his three sons were all slain. Lord Roderick Blackwood was also slain. So, King Arlen Durandon saw this as an opportunity and he took it upon himself to claim the Riverlands as the realm of the Storm Kings. So, Storm's End would rule the Riverlands for more than three centuries. Wow. How far away they are, right? You got to cross over the Crownlands to get to the Riverlands. And they would rule them for three centuries, during which time several leaders, such as Lucifer Justman, Mark Mudd, Robert Vance, Peter Malister, Lady Jane Nutt, uh, Sir Adam Rivers, <laughs> <laughs> Jane, Nutt. Jane Nutt, Lady Jane Nutt, and Sir Lyman Fisher, they all rose in rebellion against House Duradon, even defeating their oppressors for a short while before the military might of Storm's End won out. And the Storm Kings were finally defeated, not even by a house from the Riverlands, but by King Harwin Hardhand of the Iron Islands. And he established his own kingdom by defeating the Storm Kings. He established his own kingdom from the Iron Islands through the Riverlands. And he was crowned, Harwin Hardhand was crowned King of the Isles and the Rivers. Harwin's son, Halak Hor, he made his seat in the Riverlands instead of on the Iron Islands. He made his seat at Fairmarket. And this guy you'll know, Harwin's grandson, Harren, when he came to power, he ordered the construction of an immense castle as a display of his wealth and his power, and the castle was named Harren Hall. And the construction took 40 years, in addition to enormous amounts of resources and capital. And in a stroke of the worst luck ever, Harren Hall... <laughs> <laughs> All that work for nothing. Yeah, completed on the same day that Aegon Targaryen lands on Westeros with his dragon. Talking All right, boss, we're done. Cut the ribbon. Is that a dragon? <laughs> No way, they ain't taking this castle, baby. As Aegon began his campaign to win Westeros, <laughs> Harren the Black, <laughs> worst fucking luck ever. He couldn't, he, he couldn't even get a day up. Yeah, right? Could even get like a weekend. We'll be sleeping we one day. <laughs> <and then you're> <laughs> fucking... <laughs> Let me just test out the bed, please. As Aegon began his campaign to win Westeros, Harren the Black had risen to new levels of unpopularity with the Riverlords. And he was called Harren the Black because his cruelty was known well throughout the Seven Kingdoms, hence the name Harren the Black. Rather than support House Hor and their tyrannical king, the River Lords rose in rebellion once again, this time joining the cause of Aegon and House Targaryen. And, now this is where House Tully comes in, they were the first of the River Lords to align with Aegon the Conqueror. So then that's with how they were, you were the first guys, doesn't matter, you send one guy, you were the first. Right. You guys are in charge. Right. Knowing the Tullys, <laughs> I don't know how good of a decision that is on Aegon's part. It seems like he made a little bit of a Catelyn Tully decision there. So go, oh, well, all right, well, you're first, so you guys are just, you're in charge of Riverlands. Houses Blackwood, Malister, Vance, Piper, Frey. <laughs> Shit out of luck. <laughs> yeah. They quickly followed suit. They're like, well, we'll help you too. Um, Harren the Black, he believed that refusing to meet Aegon in battle would mean that Aegon, via the River Lords, would have no choice but to lay siege on Harrenhal. That didn't worry him too much because Harrenhal was now the most powerful castle in Westeros. Laying siege to it, it wouldn't do much good because Harrenhal had these huge storerooms, had plenty of food to last out any a siege of any length. Instead of laying siege, though, Aegon just attacked with his dragons. <laughs> but, but wouldn't you think, like, you know, wouldn't you think, like, common sense, this guy's got dragons, I might not be so safe here? <laughs> well, it makes you wonder, like, there were dragons around at this time. There were, Dragons were, were plentiful. Valyria had met its doom by this point in time, but these guys know there are dragons in the world. Right, right, right. 
you would think like, well, maybe, maybe he's got dragons. So I guess he must have just thought that, yeah, he's got dragons, but dragons can't possibly burn down a castle. He was wrong because they basically burned down the castle, burning and melting Harren Hall with dragon fire and then burning and melting Black Harren and his heirs as they hit out in the tower. So after the fall of Harren Hall and Black Harren, Aegon Targaryen raises Lord Edmund Tully to Lord Paramount of the Trident, rulers of the Riverlands and below only the rule of House Targaryen. There's another interesting fact from Aegon's conquest about the Riverlands, and I think you know this. I feel like I, I knew this already. I know I knew this already. It's just one of those things I forgot. The Inn of the Kneeling Man. You know why it was named the Inn of the Kneeling Man? No. Nah. You do. I know you do. It was built on the Red Fork where King Torn Stark, the king of the oh, north. Oh, okay. That's, and that's where, he, that's where he knelt. The king who knelt. Surrenders to Aegon's rule. He's like, nope. Nope, I'm good. We're good with the dragons. Whatever you want, boss. Here, here's my crown. Take it. <laughs> yeah. Where no one else knows where it is. Yeah, we, we don't need kings in the yeah. north anyway. It's, it's fine. Where do you think that crown is? Sidebar. Because that was the last crown until Rob's, which was a right. replica. And, and it wasn't Torrin's crown that they picked this guy out of the crypt. Like, here, here, Rob, here you go. Right, right. Yeah, they had to make it. When they say they make it, it's a Catelyn chapter, and she says that they made it as best they could from what is known of how it looked. So none of them have ever seen it. It's just somebody saw it, wrote it down, and that's been going through generations. I don't know. I mean, you think it's something that's still around? I, uh, I don't know. It could be one of those dirty objects that could be in Leanna Stark's crypt. <laughs> it's just bursting at the seams with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> They're like they open it, they're like, oh my god, Aunt Liana was a was a hoarder. <laughs> got a sword in here, we got a harp, a couple of scrolls. <laughs> oh, a crown. <laughs> crown of the kings of the north. All right, so Lord Edmund Tully, who had just been named Lord Paramount of the Riverlands, he was able to undo a lot of the damage done during the reign of Harren the Black. And for the most part, the River Lords remained united under the rule of House Tully during the entire reign of House Targaryen. This is true despite the many conflicts that would easily find footing in the region. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you a question. Sure. If, uh, look at the Riverlands, what area of the world, of our world, would you compare it to? Hmm. That's a good question. Like, I feel like, like the North is Russia. Yeah, okay. Okay. And they're Canada type thing. Dorne is kind of like the Middle East. Yeah. I think with, you know what, I would say, I would say maybe America, you know, North America, except that the lack of natural boundaries and the constant war, the constant conflicts that happen there. So I think instead of saying America, I might say Europe, not counting Great Britain, which is an island mm -hmm. on itself, but, you know, all those interconnected first world countries over in Europe, not that they war constantly, but the world wars, that, that's where everything was going down because right. they're so connected. I think I might say that. Yeah. You know, maybe the reach is more like America or the Westerlands because they, they do have a natural border and some natural protection from invaders, whereas the Riverlands, they, they just don't. So some of the conflicts, I'll try to go through these pretty brief, but just to give an example of some of the conflicts that occurred in the Riverlands during the reign of Targaryens. As we know, it wasn't all fucking peaches and cream. The rule under House Targaryen. You had Harren the Red, and Harren the Red was an outlaw who claimed to be the grandson of Black Harren. I don't know where this guy came from, but he rebelled against King Aenys Targaryen, and he killed Lord Gargan Coheres, Q-O-H-E-R-Y-S, and that was the house that was ruling Harrenhal at the time. So he killed this lord, and he took over Harrenhal. So King Aenys sent a host under the banners of House Tully to march on Harren Hall and put an end to Harren the Red. Harren Red learned that they were coming, so he put the people of Harren Hall to the sword, took as much wealth as he could carry, and he took off for the hills. Actually, it was Lord Alan Stokeworth who was the hand to the king at the time, and several hundred men marching from King's Landing who would corner Harren the Red in a small town by the God's Eye. That's a pretty interesting time. And that was the last George R.R. R. Martin original writing about Westeros. That was in the collection of novellas that came out last summer. The Book of Swords, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. The last Gardner Duvois <laughs> fucking uh, joint. 
<laughs> but it was a story called The Sons of the Dragon, and it was basically about Aegon's heirs and the difficulties they had in ruling the way their father did. Several river lords joined Prince Aegon Targaryen when he denounced his uncle, King Maegor Targaryen, who was also known as Maegor the Cruel. Prince Aegon denounced his uncle as evil and unworthy of the Iron Throne. So it was almost another, well, it wouldn't have been another Dance of the Dragons. This would have been the first Dance of the Dragons. And House Tully made the decision to remain loyal to King Maegor the Cruel. And during the battle beneath the God's Eye, Prince Aegon Targaryen, who was campaigning to take the Iron Throne for himself, he was killed. So King Maegor punished the rebel river lords who had sided with his nephew. While House Tully remained loyal to Maegor, Houses Frey, House Piper, House Vance, they had all sided with Prince Aegon, thinking that, all right, you know, maybe uh, if we're loyal to this guy and he wins out. Right, right, right. Yeah, we'll probably we'll get Riverlands. But, yes. yes. But they don't. Maegor wins. Frey, Piper, Vance, they lose some land and they all have to give up hostages to the Iron Throne. And then later, during the Dance of the Dragons, the Targaryen Civil War, and this Civil War, it consumed basically the entirety of the realm. I don't think it went as far as the North, but Northmen did get involved in the battle. The River Lords were basically all united under the rule of House Tully for the Dance of the Dragons, meaning the side that House Tully took was the side that the River Lords also took. That was the side of the Blacks, Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen. And that was the side that eventually won. During the Dance of the Dragons, Prince Daemon Targaryen, he led an assault on Harrenhal, along with the Blackwoods. And along with the Blackwoods, he defeated the Brackens at the Battle of the Burning Mill, and they took the Bracken seat of Stonehenge. The Green Army of Prince Aegon, made up of military from the Westerlands, they were victorious in the Battle of the Red Fork, but they were defeated by a alliance of rivermen and northmen in the battle by the lakeshore. In response, Prince Aemon Targaryen and his dragon burned much of the Riverlands. But then Prince Aemon was killed in the battle above the God's Eye by Prince Daemon. Sir Criston Cole, who was known as the Kingmaker, he led an army of greens through the Riverlands, but they were hampered by scorched earth tactics, which is what they did with Napoleon when he marched on Russia. Mm -hmm. The Alliance of Rivermen and Northmen basically crushed Sir Criston Cole and the Green Army in an ambush south of the God's Eye. This battle was called the Butcher's Ball. That's as brief a Riverlands history as we can give you. That brings you up to what we'll call the current generation of Tullys, the House Tully of A Song of Ice and Fire. That was the brief version, ladies and gentlemen. That was not... That was the brief version. We could <laughs> go way more in depth. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys know your Dance of the Dragons history, because that's just too long of a sidebar. But as of the events of A Song of Ice and Fire, House Tully is one of the great houses of the Seven Kingdoms. It's pretty interesting, because who are the great houses? I'm talking about at the beginning, in the Game of Thrones, the great houses of Westeros are House Tyrell, House Martell, House Baratheon, House Lannister, House Stark, right. House Arryn, and House Tully. I would say that I'm looking at it, you know, as a person getting into the role. I, I think, like, Tully, Aaron, they're like a mid-major. I, I, I wouldn't put them... Yeah, okay. I wouldn't put them on the same level as, you know, a Baratheon last or a Stark. I'll agree with you with House Tully. Up until yesterday, I would have agreed with you with House Aaron, except that the population number of the Vale just blew me away, so... I would say that those they numbers are, might be inflated. Are they, are they counting dead yeah. bodies also? Is this some of those right. trickle trick elections? <laughs> they haven't uh, named some dead people voting, <laughs> but I'll try to remember to put up the link. It's Atlas of Ice and Fire blog. They got to these numbers based on soldiers, maybe. Yeah, based on number of soldiers, and they base it you just know, seems uh, one soldier means X amount of common people, so they base it on. The numbers on the field that each of these great houses or regions can put on the field, how many soldiers, and then they use that to extrapolate how many common people. And it does sound like it's kind of far-fetched, but it also does make a little bit of sense if you think about it. How many soldiers are there per every 10 civilians? And there is a formula to it. I mean, it's, it's math. You can always find a, a medium number by division or multiplication or whatever, but it's not necessarily completely accurate. And four million does seem like a lot for the Vale. Trying to make it work with the tribes in the mountains. All right, well, how many fucking people, how many 
wildings could there possibly be in the Vale? I mean, you talk about a population of 4 million, what the wildings in the mountains make up? Like, at most, I feel like 10,000 wildings would be a hell of a lot of wildings to be living in the fucking mountains of the, of, of the moon. So then you're thinking like these towns in, in the Vale, I don't think any of them are even qualify as cities. You know, how many fucking people are living there? I think 4 million may be a little much. So maybe you're right. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the fence with uh, House Aaron. But yeah, House Tully is no House Stark. It's no House Lannister. It's no House Martell. But the thing about these great houses, John, it's like House Stark has always ruled the North and they were kings in the North. Mm-hmm. House Lannister, their history doesn't go back as far as House Stark, but they were kings of the Westerlands. They were kings. The Tyrells, they were not kings. They were stewards. Mm -hmm. The gardeners were the kings. The Martells, I mean, they called themselves kings until they got involved with the dragons. The Irons, they were kings. But the Tullys, they were never kings. And they actually weren't even stewards or they weren't overlords of anything until House Targaryen was in charge of Westeros. It's interesting because House Tully and House Tyrell, of the great noble houses of Westeros, those two are, they're kind of like up jumps. I mean, they were noble houses, but they weren't powerful until they made decisions to support an invader. Like their decision to support someone trying to conquer their lands, it was the right decision because that conqueror did conquer their lands, but their decision to support the invader led to them becoming one of the most powerful houses in Westeros. Lord Hoster Tully rules the Riverlands as of A Song of Ice and Fire. He rules the Riverlands from River Run as Lord Paramount of the Trident. The sigil of House Tully, we know, is the silver trout leaping on a striped field of blue and mud red. And John, what are the famous house words of the Tullys? Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker, baby. <laughs> It's hook, line, and sinker if you think that they really follow the words of family, duty, and honor. House Tully follows the faith of the seven, but River Run does keep a godswood. They are an older house, although I wouldn't quite call them an ancient house. Their origins, as far as maesters and students of the Citadel, as far as they can tell, their origins date back to the Age of Heroes, and a Sir Edmure Tully and his sons who were allies of King Christopher for Mud. And again, <laughs> despite the alliance with King Christopher Mud, who was king of the rivers and the hills, mm -hmm. despite this alliance, the Tullys knelt to the Andal Conqueror, <laughs> Armistad Vance. Although, this time, they knelt to the Conqueror after the death of King Christopher. But Vance, he gifted the land where the Red Fork and the Tumblestone meet to Sir Edmure Tully's son, Axel Tully. And it was on this land that Armistad Vance gifted to Axel Tully, this land where the Red Fork and the Tumblestone meet. This is where Axel constructed River Run. They held River Run for a thousand years as powerful vassals to those houses that were kings of the rivers and the hills. Often House Tully defended the Trident and its lands from the kings of the rock, and the kings of the rock were House Lannister. There were times that House Tully did not support the kings of the rivers and the hills, in particular when Lord Elston Tully died supporting Lord Roderick Blackwood against House Teague, and when Lord Tom and Tully supported a failed rebellion led by Lady Agnes Blackwood against Harwin Hoar, King of the Iron Islands. What that's saying is they did not support the king of the rivers and the hills when King Humphrey Teague was king of the rivers and the hills, and he had conquered the riverlands, and Harwin Hoare, he had conquered the riverlands, so they had been invaders who took over the riverlands. And like we said, they rose to power during Aegon's conquest of Westeros. Lord Edmund Tully led the Riverlords, rebelling against the rule of King Harry the Black. We said all this. House Tully, after being named Lords Paramount of the Riverlands, they continued to prove their worth to House Targaryen. King Aenys was able to lean on House Tully. Okay, we get to a period in time which is much more recent, the Great Council of 101 AC. This has to do with King Jaehaerys, not the conciliator. The wise. The wise, yeah. The old king, they called him. Aemon Targaryen, he was the son and heir to King Jaehaerys I. He died in 92 AC, and he died fighting Mirish pirates on Tarth. King Jaehaerys chose Aemon's younger brother, Balon, as his new heir. 
and in doing so, he passed over Princess Rhaenys, who was Prince Aemon's daughter. So his son Aemon had a daughter, Prince Rhaenys, and Aemon also had a brother, Balan. Aemon was Jaehaerys' heir. He dies. Jaehaerys is still king, so Balon is his heir instead of Aemon's daughter, Princess Rhaenys. And this was before heirship was male before female, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I guess it was more like Dorne at this point in time. So Balon Targaryen was named heir, and he was also named Hand to the King. He had three sons. He served well as Hand to the King, but he was only Hand to the King for a year. Because in 101 AC, Prince Balon died of a burst belly during a hunting trip. And this created the need for a new heir. So King Jaehaerys, being as wise as he was, instead of choosing another heir, he called for a great council to decide on who the new heir to the Iron Throne would be. Many Westerosi historians call him the greatest of the Dragon Kings. He ruled for 50 years of peace and prosperity. So many believe that this decision to call a great council to figure out who his heir would be, Mm -hmm. they think it's a, a good decision. When they called this council, there were 11 names put forth, and not all of them were Targaryen. Nine of them were dismissed out of hand. The two real contenders were Laenor Valerian and Viserys Targaryen, both of old Valyrian blood. And by the time of the Great Council, both had their own dragon. Viserys rode Valyrian the Black Dread, and Laenor had just recently started riding a dragon named Sea Smoke. But favor of the council went to Viserys as he was a Targaryen. But more importantly, because he was of the male line, he was of Balon's line. And the High Lords believed. This took precedence over the female line. Also, Viserys was 24 and Lenore was 7. So, And this is what started the, the male first succession before female, was this great council. So Lord Grover Tully supported the decision to make Viserys the heir, and he was made the heir. So again, the Tullys come through for House Targaryen. And there's another thing that's kind of, <laughs> it's not really interesting, but it's actually kind of silly. But just keep in mind the name oh, no. Grover Tully. You'll see why in a minute. Oh, no. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny, dude. The Great Council indirectly led to the Dance of the Dragons. And during the Dance of the Dragons, House Tully ruled over the River Lords. Lord Grover Tully, he wanted to support Queen Alicent and the Green Faction. However, by the time of the Dance of the Dragons, Grover Tully was much older. And not that they thought Grover Tully was senile, but they were like, yeah, all right, you know, whatever, Pops. We got this. So his grandson... Elmo Tully, and his great-grandson, Kermit Tully. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he follows me. No, it's not true. Come on. It's no. true, bro. I swear to God. Stop it. <laughs> I swear to God, bro. Grover Tully, Elmo Tully, and Kermit Tully. <laughs> no wonder why he can't stand the stuff in the goddamn front. How are we supposed to take this family seriously? <laughs> Elmo Grover and fucking Kirby. <sighs> Who's next? Big Bird? <laughs> Big Bird Tully. <laughs> oh, God, I can't. Uh, uh, so Grover wanted to side with Queen Alice in the green, but his grandson Elmo and his great grandson <laughs> Kirby. <laughs> you know, I was waiting for the punchline on Grover. Okay, what's he going to write about? What's he going to say? What's Smith said? Cookie Monster Tully. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Elmo and Kermit go over Grover's head, and they decide to support Princess Rhaenyra and what would be the winning faction, the Blacks. Um, Elmo and Grover both <laughs> <laughs> both die during the Targaryen Civil War, but Kermit survives. And during the Targaryen Civil War, during the Dance of the Dragons, Kermit Tully slays Lord Boros Baratheon. I can't take this during the Battle of the That's just got to be a yeah. joke. He had to have done it on purpose. I mean, there's no way, like... <laughs> Unless maybe somebody went on and fucked with the Song of Ice and Fire Wikipedia. It ha- that has to be. Come yeah, on, there's be. no way. <laughs> this is no way. <laughs> I've never seen it. I'm sure someone would have brought this up, like, how much of a joke this is. <laughs> Hold on. Well, how deep are people digging into House Tully, really? Kermit Tully, I'm going to Google it right now. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Crazy, right? It just can't. It just can't. It just can't. Sir Kermit's father, Elmo Tully, became head of the family upon the death of Lord Grover Tully shortly after the Second Battle of Templeton. It just can't. Uh, there was a there was a Grover had a son that's unknown. 
Well, he must have been fucking Big Bird Tully. Or Bert. Or Ernie. Ernie Tully. Behind the scenes, Kermit, blah, blah, blah. References by George R. Warren to the Muppets. But why make it so obvious? Right? Like, like, I, can like how, get, I can get Grover and Elmo. Yeah, but a little bit. Like, how about, like, like Henson Tully? Or, like. Yeah, but you put Kermit in there? Like, it's Ernest so, Tully. Yeah, Kermit, like, you made, like, Mickey Mouse Tully. Like, it's yeah. Miss Piggy Tully. Well, I guess that's, that's Lysa, right? Yeah. But, um, psh. Yeah, it's a little, little on the nose. House Tully remained loyal to House Targaryen during all five of the Blackfire Rebellions. So House Tully has always seemed to be survivors. And they are survivors because they have always chosen the right side during these major conflicts. But another important part of House Tully's survival has been their alliances, which goes hand in hand with picking the right side in these conflicts. Seeking alliances became a very important part of House Tully policy. It's also important because of the location and the vulnerability of the Riverlands. So if you have no natural defenses, no natural barriers, you need to make sure that you have strong alliances around you so that you can come together to protect yourselves. So that brings us basically to just before the events of A Song of Ice and Fire. And this is a subject that we, we went over pretty much in depth, the Fifth Black Fire Rebellion, which was also called the War of the Nine Penny Kings. During this conflict, House Tully once again supports the Targaryens, but this time it was basically all the High Lords of Westeros supporting House Targaryen. Mm -hmm. Hoster Tully and Brynden Tully, his brother, they fought in the War of the Nine Penny Kings alongside Lord Orman Baratheon and his son, Sir Stephen Baratheon, Sir Jason Lannister, who was fighting for his brother, Lord Titus Lannister of Casterly Rock, and Sir Jason's nephew, Tywin Lannister. Prince Aerys Targaryen, Winterfell, Pike, and Dorne, they also fought for House Targaryen, although I think it's assumed that Rickard Stark fought, but it's not directly canon that Rickard Stark fought in the War of the Nine Penny Kings. But we do know that the War of the Nine Penny Kings was really the birthplace of what you want to call the Southern Ambitions or the Secret Council of Rhaegar Targaryen, the idea of the Great Houses forming alliances to protect themselves from the Targaryens. It was birthed here during the War of the Nine Penny Kings, and not birth outright here, where they're like, hey, we should get together to protect ourselves against Prince Ares, because one day maybe he'll become king and become mad. It was just the birth of fighting alongside each other, developing these relationships, and staying in contact with one another, which would later on turn into what we know as Southern Ambitions, Rhaegar's Secret Council. So that pretty much brings us to the events of A Song of Ice and Fire, or at least to a spot where we can talk about Hoster Tully. Thank you for listening to The Princes That Were Promised. Tearing apart Westeros. Sifting through the pieces. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash The Promised Princes. Follow us on Twitter at Princes Promised. You can check us out at theprincesthatwerepromised.tumblr.com. We are on Instagram, sort of. Follow The Princes That Were Promised with an underscore in between each word. Check out the Westerosi Companion. You can find the Westerosi Companion at theprincesthatwerepromised.com. The RSS feed is located at thepromisedprinces.actionpackedpodcasts.com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, on the Google Play Store, on Stitcher, you can also find us on SoundCloud, if that is your cup of tea. And check out our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. We will be back next week talking about Hoster Tully and all of his fantastic children. John, always a pleasure. We will speak with you guys later. Ba, 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 ba,